Hi everyone, my name is Greg Rowe and I'm going to be talking to you guys about the human body. Uh, we're going to discuss anatomical position and its references. This is Kinesiology 101, basically describing movement. Describing exactly how different professionals uh, label and describe movement of the human body. Uh, so we'll get right into it, um, but please before I get started, I just want you guys to know that uh, I would love feedback. I would love to learn from this sort of stuff. It is a training tool as well as a learning tool as well as trying to help you guys out as much as I can. Uh, if there's anything that I don't make very clear or that sounds wrong or something you want or a reference like why I think this, please let me know uh, and I can find uh, some references and stuff like that. But uh, please let me know if there's anything that you'd rather me talk about, if there's a specific topic or anything like that. But I'm going to basically just build it up so that as uh, when I start writing more articles and stuff like that, it's easier to understand what I'm talking about because if I were to take uh, an article, say a uh, from a journal and I basically took out all the words that I'm going about to teach you and there's even hundreds more that I'm not going to even mention but if we took all those out then it, the word the article will go from like maybe 2,000 words to about 10,000 words so we're just trying to simplify it and once you kind of learn the language of the human body it kind of goes a little bit faster and it all makes sense because it's based on a prefixes and suffixes and patterns and you, you'll start to see what I mean as we get into it <clears throat> So here we have anatomical position. This guy's standing here with his palms forward, thumbs out to the side, feet facing forward, torso up, head forward. This is your basic reference. So whenever we're talking about something, we are basically coming back to this drawing here. Uh, if you guys know who Leonardo da Vinci is, he made a very famous uh, drawing of a man that kind of looks like this with his arms out to the side with a circle around it. And that was thought to be the first uh, anatomical position drawing ever. But I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what I was told by somebody. But it is interesting that even back way back in those days, it was still being thought of as the same way for the body. And it hasn't changed. We still reference the body in the same kind of similar characteristics. And I think that's kind of interesting considering how I don't even think that I still do the same stuff I did five years ago. Never mind hundreds of years ago. So for something to last this long, uh, it must be pretty sturdy and it seems to be working pretty well. So let's get right into the planes. So we got your frontal plane, your sagittal plane, your transverse plane. Your frontal plane is going to cut you into front and back halves, your posterior and anterior. Anterior meaning front, posterior meaning behind. Uh, you'll see this quite a lot when we start labeling muscles because you'll say, well, anything on the back is going to be posterior. So if I'm going to talk about uh, the, del the deltoid, which is your shoulder muscle here, and but there's three parts, so I'm going to say, oh, well, there's a posterior deltoid, and that means, oh, the part on the back, which actually moves a little bit differently than your anterior deltoid, which is actually at the front. We will get into more of this when we talk about anatomy, but it does become quite important, so you may you really do want to learn these. Uh, you got your sagittal plane, which is going to cut you in front, uh, or sorry, uh, left and right hemispheres. So you got your left leg and left arm, right leg and right arm. Uh, and you're just imagining what well, you can imagine for the planes that there's a glass cutting this guy in half in these different ways. And anything that moves along that glass, that's, that's the plane. That's the direction of movement. Uh, we also have a transverse plane. If you remember nothing else, remember that transverse basically means to spin. Your transverse plane is cutting this guy in half for upper body and lower body. And as he turns, he is actually turning in that plane. So any kind of double full, triple full, octuple full, whatever it is, is going to be in the transverse plane. So let's look into a little bit more detail here. Um, you got the frontal plane, as you can see here, is our imaginary little glass. And when he moves his arms like a jumping jack, he's or like a jumping jack, he's moving them in the frontal plane. They're out to the side. You can see his legs are also in that plane. If his leg goes forward or backwards, or his arm goes forward or backwards, he's no longer in the frontal plane anymore. Now he's in the another plane, which we'll get into. But this is an easy way to kind of imagine which plane, and we'll have a little test on it to see if you guys can uh, memorize this stuff. But it should be said now that you're not supposed to really be memorizing. That was probably a bad word. Uh, you have to really understand. You have to uh, appreciate the suffixes and prefixes and the root words, which will help you identify the language of the human body. And we'll get more into it as we get into depth, but uh, start thinking ways to, uh, to understand rather than just to memorize, because you will forget. So we got our sagittal plane now. So as you can see, this guy here, he's got now his plane of glass cutting him in left and right hemispheres, as we mentioned. And any kind of movement that slides along that glass is going to be in your sagittal plane. 
so that means any kind of leg movement forward and backwards, arm movement forward and backwards, anterior, posterior, uh, even head movement, torso movement, anything. Running forward is in a sagittal plane. Running backwards in the sagittal plane. Sitting down here doing seated leg extension is in the sagittal plane. Uh, you can, if you can imagine his legs relax and then he lifts that weight forward, that's now going along the same uh, direction of that plane of glass or uh, glass pane plane. I don't even know. Anyways, but yeah, so any kind of movement, if you are moving forward, it, you're still in the sagittal plane. You don't have to be sit seated. You don't have to be moving as a whole body. Just one little thing can be moving in a certain plane while something else is moving in a different plane. You'll And you'll start realizing not everything's cut and dry. You kind of find a lot of gray areas and you start to uh, kind of mix and match all your planes and references. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but uh, so the transverse plane here, uh, it's going to cut you just like I said, like a hula hoop. It's going to cut you in upper halves and lower halves. Um, upper is actually superior. Lower is inferior. Uh, I don't actually think I put this in the slide, but I will uh, make a note of it in the description when I post this online. Um, but yes, yeah, so you're cutting yourself into uh, superior, upper and inferior half, lower. And any kind of movement, which is twisting movement, uh, that goes along in this plane is going to be following the glass. So if he puts his hands flat on that glass as if that uh, little box there is actually a concrete and he moves around it, you can see he's spinning and that is in your transverse plane. So any double full, uh, quadruple full, whatever, and it doesn't matter to, uh, what direction you're twisting as long as you're twisting. Um, should be noted here actually that we have the transverse. So this is a perfect example of exactly why we use the human body and references. So when I'm talking about the transverse abdominis, this is a deep muscle in uh, your abdomen that basically stabilizes the rib cage when you're do doing jumps, doing bounding, tumbling, whatever it is that you're doing. And it basically stops you from collapsing. Uh, it works uh, synergistically. Synergistically means to uh, work along with. So it's not just the only muscle that does it. Uh, but it works along with a bunch of other muscles that keep you tight without moving. It also adds a bit of uh, rotation, not much. You'll see that the rotation actually comes from other muscles when we do anatomy. But you can see that transverse means to go across. And the transverse plane goes across the body. It, and you'll start picking up on these uh, cues and these uh, commonalities. And you'll start being able to kind of put everything together. And it does make sense once you do it. At the first couple of years I was in school, I was lost. I was like, what is going on here? But then I started really taking it. And I started seeing more of these words in other literature that wasn't presented in class. And then it started showing me, oh, so people really do use this stuff. And it gave me appreciation for what the teachers were talking about. And I really took it in and tried to create acronyms and patterns to try to help myself memorize the different ways the body moved. Um, and it's really helped a lot. And now I kind of understand exactly what's going on. But like anything, I still got a lot to learn. But let's go on. So let's talk about your axis of rotation now. So we did our planes, but now let's talk about exactly um, how we're going to rotate. Because if you're an acrobatic like me, an acrobatic athlete of any kind, you're going to be very interested in figuring out, okay, well, how does the body move? Why does it move this way? And we're going to first label exactly the rotation axis, and then we can teach people exactly how to create the rotation, which I've actually uh, done for you guys in my how to flip uh, tutorial. Um, but let's not talk about that right now. Let's just get into uh, the axis. So you got your longitudinal axis, which is your spinning. This is the same axis. This is the goes aligned with the plane, uh, with your transverse plane. Because as you're spinning, you're moving the transverse plane, which also means you're spinning about the longitudinal axis. You got your anterior posterior axis, which is just the axis that basically goes right through your belly button and uh, basically is your cartwheel. This is the axis when you do a side summit for all you parkour guys, for when you do a cartwheel, um, even a round off, depending on how you do it, you can, you'll go through this axis. You got your medial lateral axis. We haven't talked about what medial and lateral are yet, but medial basically means inward, lateral means outwards, uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. But this is gonna cut your, or not cut your body, but this is like a nail going through your body, through uh, your hips and it's like a high bar. You can think that there's a high bar in the hips and then any kind of rotation, any kind of hip circle around this bar will be on this axis. But we'll get more into that in a second. So we do have special cases um, when we're talking about our axis and all these other references. Um, there's some that just kind of have its own name but it doesn't refer to a 
a large uh, description of different types of movement. Like if I was going to say medially, I'd say, well, I can say the arm moves medially. I can say the thumb moves medially. I can say the leg moves medially. I can say that for the, the entire body. But some of these special ones, they don't really kind of classify as a, a whole body reference. It's just uh, very specific. So you got your dorsiflexion and your plant plantar flexion, which just basically talks about your toe movement. Dorsi meaning that you're basically flexing the foot upwards towards your shin. And planter means that you're pointing it downwards. I, the way I remember it, planter means point, or planter is point. I'm not sure if that's actually the, uh, what the word means, but P and P, so that's how I put it together. And then dorsiflexion is going up. Um, dorsal is actually the top of your foot, so that's why they call it dorsal flexion. And planter flexion, uh, planter is the bottom side of your foot, and that's why they call it that. Um, then you got your supination and pronation. Um, Basically, now I, uh, actually, I should go back and say something. Um, I don't know if when you m move your hand up and down, if you could call that dorsiflexion or an, um, and plantar flexion. Uh, I'm not really sure. If someone knows, let me know. But I never really thought of it until literally just now. So, because usually we just say flexion and extension, but just a uh, one a little comment. So. Uh, let's go supination and pronation. Uh, now this one really got a lot of people confused in class, including myself. We never really figured out which one it was, but our teacher gave us a great acronym, or not an acronym, but a great way of thinking of it. Um, pronation, your arms are, your hands are facing down. So if you're in anatomical position, you're actually now turned your thumbs towards your body. So your thumbs are now touching your leg. Rather, before an anatomical position, their thumbs were out. So that's pronation, is turning inwards. Supination is turning outwards. Um, the way I remembered it is that outwards, you, supination, you're holding a, a bowl of soup. Now, that's the way I figured out or memorized it. It seems to work. You got your, now for the ankle, you got your eversion and inversion. Uh, this one gets a little bit tricky. Um, eversion is basically you're now turning the ankle outwards and dorsiflexing. Eversion is you are plantar flexing and turning the foot inwards. Uh, when you're having an ankle injury, it's much more common to have an inversion rather than an eversion. Just it's the way the bone structure and the ligaments that actually go across you're a lot stronger on your um, uh, medial side with the muscles. But the way the bones work is that you actually don't have the range of motion. So it's hard to evert the ankle and you can't uh, move it. If you sit here right now and try to evert your ankle, it doesn't go very far. You don't want it to because those ones get really, really nasty. So let's talk about relative position a little bit. We already discussed medial and lateral a little bit. Um, but medial, basically, again, is uh, in towards the middle of the body. Lateral is towards the outside of the body. Now, we're not talking about anything uh, externally from the body. We're talking about different parts of the body in relation to each other. So if I'm going to say something, I would say that uh, the sternum is medial to the shoulders, meaning the sternum is closer to the midline of the body than the shoulders. If I was, I could say that the shoulders are lateral to the sternum. And just, uh, for those of you guys who are in another uh, country and maybe don't know what sternum is, uh, your sternum is that bone in your chest, that hard one there, uh, right in the middle. Um, but yeah, so if I was going to say, okay, um, my ears are lateral to my eyes, meaning my ears are farther away from the center of my body than my eyes are. My eyes are medial to my ears. And it's just two ways of saying the same thing. Depends on the person. Some people like to refer laterally. Some people like to refer medially. It's all the same. Um, intermedial basically means in between. So if I was going to say um, your ears are lateral to your eyes, but your... Oh, that's not a good example. Okay, let's say the ears are lateral to your eyes, and your nose is medial to your eyes. I would say the eye is intermedial between the nose and the ears, right? So it's in the middle. So if I wanted to say the belly button is intermedial uh, to my uh, left and right iliac crest. Now I know you guys probably don't know what an iliac crest is, but we'll get into that when we do anatomy. Uh, your iliac crest is basically the two bones. If you touch your sides and you go all the way down to your hips, you'll feel two hard bones. That's your iliac crest. So now, if I'm going to say, okay, well, the belly button's in the middle of those, so I'll say the belly button's intermedial to my iliac crests. I could also say things like um, my third finger is intermedial to my fourth and first finger. It's in between. 
right? and the, the examples go on and on. So proximal and distal, uh, I don't think we've talked about these too much yet. Uh, proximal meaning basically towards the center of the body, which I know it sounds confusing with medial and lateral. I probably should have uh, reworded it. But proximal is more talking about um, l a length of an appendage. So if I'm going to say, uh, I'll give an example, it's much easier. Uh, I'll say that the, the elbow is proximal uh, to the hand meaning that the elbow is actually closer to the center of the body than the hand is. I would say that the hand is distal to the elbow because the hand is uh, more away from the center of the body. I would say that, uh, another example here, I would say that the foot is distal to the hip. I would say the hip is proximal to the foot. Proximal meaning closer to the center of your body. Um, which is like your sternum, which technically isn't really the center of your body, but in terms of relative position stuff, we will look at it that way. Um, and then distal, meaning that it's basically away. So we have not talked about scapular movement yet. Um, it's not really too important at this point, but it's good just uh, as another example of how we basically use the words because these words we use all the time. And like uh, elevation, for example, there will be muscles called your levator scapula, which basically elevate your scapula. And it'll, it'll, these words just kind of uh, come together to, to help describe the movement. Um, but your four possible movements, or your main four, so you got your elevation, depression, your abduction, which is really called protraction, and your adduction, which is retraction, which we'll just go into in a second. So elevation means basically that the scapula is moving upwards. If you can imagine that you got your rib cage, and then you basically have your scapula, it's a free-floating bone. It's just kind of attached by ligaments and muscles. It's not actually, a, it's not a one solid uh thing uh, attached to your ribs it's it's free floating so when uh, the muscles that cause my scapula to elevate get contracted and they pull and get shorter my el my scapula will go up when i use the muscles more in the middle of my back to um, abduct my my scapula it pulls it towards the center of my body so and we'll get to abduction and adduction in a second. Um, depression, basically that's going to do is uh, the muscles that are going to be below your scapula, that are maybe coming from your lower spine and stuff like that, um, are going to pull down on the scapula. The whole point of moving the scapula is just opens up the joint. You have your, uh, your shoulder joint, which we'll get into more when we do anatomy, but it moves around, and the, where it moves determines how much movement you can get in your shoulder joint, which will be important later on when we talk about more shoulder technique. But for now, just know that the scapula can move around. All right, guys, time for a test. So uh, take a couple seconds and see if you can label the axis of rotation and the plane of movement each one of these is going through. All right, so let's start with the front pike and back pike. Uh, as you can see, she's going through the medial lateral axis because the if you can imagine a bar is at her hips and is ro she's rotating upon that or around that bar. Uh, for the plane, she is now in the sagittal plane because she's moving anteriorly or posteriorly as she's rotating forward or backwards, um, depending on which one she's doing. But that's your in your sagittal plane. Uh, let's look at the cat twist. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the axis of rotation is your longitudinal axis, meaning the like a bar is going right through his head all the way to his feet, and he's spinning around that axis. Um, the plane of reference, uh, yeah, the plane of movement, sorry, is the transverse plane. If you remember from the first couple of slides, it said that your transverse plane is always your spinning plane. So if this guy's doing a single cat twist, quadruple cat twist, uh, spinning left or right ways, doesn't matter. He's still going through your longitudinal axis and through your transverse plane. And I'll be using this later on in tutorials, so uh, hopefully you guys will remember that. Uh, your straddle jump. This one's a little bit tricky. Um, your axis of rotation, uh, she is going through her medial lateral axis because she is piking her legs slightly. Yes, her legs are out to the side, but if you can imagine what would happen if she uh, had her legs straddled standing on the ground as if she was about to go into middle splits. But now she has now uh, rotated those up uh, along the medial lateral axis uh, up to uh, where her hips are. So you can see that movement. Her torso is going forward, and she's also going through the... Uh, medial lateral axis because she's leaning forward now. Um, 
So the plane, though, she's going through is a little different. So the, the axis is easy. The plane, she's going through her sagittal plane because her feet are coming in front, which means which is just like your front pike, your forward and backward movement. So her feet come up, sagittal plane. But her feet are also going to the side. So and that's the frontal plane. Because if you can imagine the glass going, uh, cutting her in half, her legs are sliding up that glass a bit as they come forward. So any kind of movement to the side is going to be your uh, frontal plane. Any movement forward is going to be in your sagittal plane. So let's look at jumping. Jumping, this one's pretty easy. You guys have probably figured it out by now. It's your sagittal plane. Um, your axis of rotation is going to be your medial lateral axis. As you can see, her torso is bending and extending based on when she's in the air and jumping. So that's a big one for uh, hip rotation. Stuff like that is your medial, uh, medial lateral axis. So uh, hopefully you guys did pretty good on that, but let's continue. So let's talk about a bit about muscle movement. So you got your three types of contraction. You got your static contraction or isometric contraction, concentric contraction, and eccentric contraction. Static or isometric basically means you're just holding it. This is where you're doing a chair sit. This is where you're uh, maybe doing a lunge and you're holding that lunge that deep at the bottom there. You're not moving. You're just telling your muscle, stay that same length and don't move. Just keep me stable here. Very important for trampoline because we are very stable. We have to be stable or we're going to fly off the trampoline. Same with gymnastics. So a lot of coaches should be doing this regularly. Um, but we'll talk about more about that when we start doing strength and conditioning. So we have concentric contraction. This is just means shortening. This actually, when we get into how the muscle works, you'll see why it shortens. But right now, all you got to know is that this is the muscle contracting, uh, pulling the bone closer and decreasing an angle so if it's in my uh, leg and I bring my knee to my butt I'm doing a concentric contraction because that angle of my knee angle is shortening that's another way to think about it um, eccentric contraction this is basically means controlled lengthening um, when I'm holding say this weight that this guy's holding in the first one with no movement uh, in the first picture here and I let it out slowly and I let it go down and I extend my arm fully, that's eccentric contraction. I'm basically controlling my muscle, telling my muscle to, hey, okay, just step by step, let it go slow. Don't drop the weight because I could land on my foot and bust my foot, but don't, um, don't stay still. I need you to slowly elongate the muscle. And it's also known as extension. Uh, concentric uh, contraction is also known as flexion. And we already discussed uh, the static and isometric contraction. So those are your basic three. You should know them because uh, there's lots of principles of training for each one of these types of movements. And you can combine them and do different stuff, which we'll get into. But for now, just know the three different types. So now we're going to be talking about basically how the muscles are moved and how we describe muscle movement. So we have hyperflexion, hyperextension, which basically means you're just taking uh, a body segment and you're moving it out of its range of motion. That's what ROM stands for. So if you guys seen that in my articles or and you'll see it a lot more because as I'm teaching you guys this stuff, I'm going to start taking shortcuts and using these acronyms just to make my life easier. So I uh, hope you guys keep up. Um, but yeah, when you're talking about hyperflexion, it basically, you're landing in a low squat like this. I actually did the quintuple back the other day, and uh, I did land like this in my knee, and I felt the pull on my ACL, which is one of the ligaments in your knee. And if you do this too hard, you will actually rip your like knee apart, literally. And um, it does, definitely doesn't feel good. And when you know when you get that, that pull on your knee, you're like, uh-oh, and you know it right away. And um, it's not good, so what you have to do is strengthen the joints. you got to do all that. But right now, don't even worry about it. Just know that hyperflexion is just as bad as hyperextension. Hyperextension is the opposite. is when you extend the, the, the muscle and it, you, can, you shorten the muscle too much to the point where it actually bends the bone or bend, uh, makes the bone go out of the joint, uh, as you can see here. Uh, this is not good. There's a lot of people that actually walk like this, and oh man, it sucks. It's really bad for your knees. You're gonna get hip problems. You're gonna get ankle problems. It's you don't want to do that. But anyways, um, we also have abduction and adduction. We we discussed this just uh, for a second earlier, but abduction basically means to take it away from the body. Adduction means to add it towards the body. This is how we 
uh, that's how most people kind of memorize it but you can make up your own way um, actually the way I memorized it was that if I'm standing in an anatomical position and the first movement I can possibly do if I'm talking about moving my arms laterally is abduction it's the, I can't adduct when I'm already by my sides right so I think okay a B that's the letters of the alphabet B become come before D so I know abduction comes first arms come out and then adduction comes after because I know then the arms come back in might be kind of complicated my brain works in weird ways but that's how I remembered it but you guys gotta find your own way so let's move on alright guys it is test time so we've uh, covered quite a bit of information, and I hope you guys have been following along. If you haven't, go back to the slides, revisit a bit, listen to it a, a hundred times if you have to. Because uh, if you have problems now, you're gonna just it's going to get worse. It gets more confusing because every lecture that I'm going to make after this, I'm going to assume that you're understanding the previous one. So I will start throwing the words out more like posterior, anterior, blah, 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 blah. And if you're if these aren't just going quick, quick in your head, like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about, you're, you're going to get lost because you're going to think, oh, wait, what, what was that again? Oh, what was that? And then all of a sudden now I've said something completely different, and now you're still back on a lecture behind. So make sure you're really in tune with these because I'll be using them all the time. And when you start reading more lectures and stuff like that, even from other people and articles, they will be using the, these references, these words all the time. So it will help you really understand what they're talking about as well. So take 10 seconds and see if you can figure out the plane of, uh, the plane of uh, reference, the type of contraction, and the axis of rotation. Okay, so uh, if you need a couple more minutes, which you might, uh, just pause the video now. Uh, if not, let's just continue. So assuming this guy is standing here with his feet together and he's just pushing his heels back, uh, we know he's going in the sagittal plane. So we know that he's moving behind him, and that's the movement in the sagittal plane as if there was a glass there, and he's sliding his leg along that glass. Uh, the axis of rotation, medial lateral axis, you can imagine that there's a bar going through his hips, and he's swinging upon, uh, upon that bar, kind of like a gymnast would uh, do giants on a high bar. Um, type of contraction, this gets a little bit confusing. We're not... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it gets a little confusing, and we're not going to get into too much detail because it'll take another hour. But basically, if you said that there's a concentric contraction, shortening, of the glutes and the hamstrings, you'd be 100% correct. If you were to say that the mm, quadriceps and the hip flexors eccentrically contracted, you'd be 100% uh, correct saying that as well. You, once you start learning how the muscles work, you start realizing that as one pulls, another one has to lengthen. It's a constant balancing act. So it, when, as the hamstrings tighten, the quads say, okay, the hamstrings want to go. Guys, come on. All right, what's going on? Okay, no, guys, we're going we're gonna to shorten. Okay, you guys lengthen. Okay, we're lengthening now. You shorten. And they match it back and forth. And you, normally you don't get too many issues, but you sometimes get problems with people that don't know how to fire the muscles properly. And this is when there's a disconnect between these two, uh, this line of communication between the muscles. And we'll, we'll get into this more later, but just know that there's more than just one type of contraction for a movement. Um, for this girl here, she is not doing concentric or eccentric. She's doing isometric. But now the trick is she is doing concentric and eccentric. She's basically balanced them perfectly. She's told her quads to fire as hard as she's told her hamstrings to fire. So she just balances there and just stays. She doesn't move anywhere. So she's doing a static type of isometric contraction. The plane of movement, well, there is no plane of movement. She's not moving. Assuming she's not doing dumbbell uh, curls and stuff like that. Assuming she's just standing exactly how she is and she's holding that for a minute, there's no plane of movement. The reference plane only works when you're doing something. When you're not moving, it doesn't matter. Same with the axis of rotation. If she's not rotating anything, she's not moving a segment of their body, she, there's no axis. So that's a little bit of a trickier one. Um, for this one over here, this guy's doing overhead press. So if you're talking about the plane of movement, you'll be talking about he's in the frontal plane. If you can imagine that there's that glass cutting him in anterior and posterior sides, his hands are just kind of sliding up that glass up over his head. That's in the frontal plane. The axis of rotation, well, he's not rotating. He's just sliding. He's just uh, moving up and down. A ro actu uh, axis means that you actually have to rotate. 
like swinging a leg or bending the body. Um, there is technically a joint in his elbow and shoulder, but we don't really refer to that as the axis. We talk about axis as the midline of the body. His midline is not moving, so he doesn't actually have an axis of rotation either. Uh, the type of contraction. Again, he's doing concentric contraction with all his uh, extensor muscles and all the f arm flexors, which are like your bicep, brachioradialis, all these other muscles, which we'll get into when we do uh, anatomy, they are eccentrically contracting. They're elongating, controlled, and while the, the extensors are contracting and shortening. And they're doing this at the same time to create movement. So uh, I hope this kind of sheds some light into a bit of the how we describe the body and its movement. There are a million other ways to do it, and there's a million other words that you'll run into. And we will tackle these as we go, but these are just the major ones that you really should know before we even move on. But then there'll be other little random ones that I'll throw in, and I'll make a point of it once uh, it comes up. But for now, just make sure you get all this, and uh, next time... Uh, I don't even know what we're going to talk about. I uh, see what inspires you. Maybe we'll talk about cell mechanics and we'll start talking about uh, this. Well, actually, no, we'll go into anatomy, I think. See, I don't even know what I want to talk about. There's so much information. It's it's hard to be able to put it all into a, a nice little uh, curriculum for you guys. But, uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk about anatomy. We'll start labeling the muscles. And you'll start seeing that uh, all the names that we've been using, like protraction, retraction, uh, transverse, medial, lateral, this, uh, we're going to really be using this a lot. Um, actually, no, I lied again. We're not doing muscles yet because you guys don't uh, label the bones yet. We start with labeling the bones, and then we start labeling the muscles that go on top of the bones. But as you can see, I'm still new at this, and I'm not really good at lectures. And I'd love to be a teacher one day at a university, so this is anything that's giving me practice. So please give me some feedback. Tell me what you like, what you didn't like. Uh, I'd love to learn. And um, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks.